good. I tuned that not two minutes ago in the back, well, 20 minutes ago now in the back room and it's all gone wonky again. So, must be more humidity in the office than out here. That's what it is. All right. Okay, kids. Hello, kids. We've got some kids with some funky hair this morning because we're having our funky hair day. Because out in Sunday school this morning, we're going to hear the story of Samson and his funky hair. And that's going to be fun. But before we do that, we're going to help the grown-ups by reading a bit of their story this morning. Uh, but first of all, we always talk about the words of Jesus. What did Jesus say? The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come here. Repent and believe the good news. All right. Wonderful. And something else Jesus said. So that was what Jesus said at the beginning of his ministry. At the end of his ministry, just as he was about to go back into heaven, he said this. Let's read this together. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Power. Power. Everybody say power. Power. All right, show me your big muscles. Power. This morning we're going to learn in Sunday school about Samson. He had a lot of power. He had big muscles. He had a lot of problems too, but we won't talk about that so much now. A lot of power. But is that the kind of power God's talking about here, Jesus is talking about? No, he's talking about power to be witnesses, to tell other people about Jesus. So that's the power we're going to talk about this morning. And then after this message, the church started to grow. And we're going to read some verses this morning about the first church in Jerusalem and the things they did. So who would like to read for me? Should we start at this end? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Got all the tricky words, but you did really well. Awe. Awe means amazement or surprise or shock. Give me your most awe struck face, your most surprised face. Some of you didn't change facial expressions at all. Are you always amazed? Are you? <laughs> she doesn't think I'm funny. Okay. Anyone else like to read? No? Gonna read? All, all the believers were together and had everything. In communion. Everything in common. They shared everything. Okay? In English, we have an old word which is commonwealth, which is the things that all the community holds in common, our commonwealth. We have the commonwealth games. We have the commonwealth government. We used to have, well, we have the commonwealth bank. Which bank? The commonwealth bank. We used to own it, all of us. We don't anymore. All right. But we won't blame who was that one who did that? Probably John Howard. We'll blame him. Eh? All right. Now, uh, they every, had everything in common. We shared everything. That's what the church says. I got it. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together at the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together. With glad, with glad and sincere, sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the flavor of all people. Love the flavor. Favor. Favor. Very good. You want to enjoy the flavor of all the people? His last one. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Very good. So the church were all together. They shared together. They, that's all there is now. There's no more. Put your hands down. They shared together. They prayed together. They listened to the apostles' teaching. Who are the apostles? Who can tell me? Yeah, Jesus. No, that's no. You're the other way around. They're the, they're the 12 original disciples were called the apostles, Peter and James and John and all those guys. Okay. So they're the apostles. They're the ones telling everyone about Jesus. They're praying together. They're worshiping together. They're looking after each other. They're caring for each other. They're sharing what they've got. If you've got a spare house, let us know. That sort of thing. 
and daily the Lord was adding new people to their fellowship. So that's the kind of power that Jesus gave to his church, the power to be his witnesses and to share and to love each other. And we're going to head out to Sunday school now and we're going to learn about a different kind of power that comes with crazy hair. All right, so let's head out. Sunday school kids, thanks for being part of our family. Remember not to run. Head out gently and I'll hand back over to our worship team. Thank you so much. Well, the Holy Spirit's already been doing a work for me this morning. Couldn't sing those words without tearing up. So many have shared this morning about concerns they have. And as I listen, there's nothing I can do other than bring it before the Lord. There's nothing I can do. And it makes my heart heavy. But I can declare those words that no matter what, and perhaps this is a prayer for you today, no matter what, we can be sure that our soul is his. We can be sure of our salvation. We can be assured that we are his. So if you've got stuff going on, be assured of that. No matter what happens here on earth, God's got your soul. And he cares and loves you. Not what we're talking about today, but there you go. If you are needing the handouts, Glenda's bringing them around. Just give her a wave and she'll bring them around. Um, this amazing building here. Anybody know this amazing building? Yes? No? Good try, though. I don't know that building. It could, maybe it's another name for it. This is the Cologne Cathedral in Cologne. I've been there. I like to say that. I've been there. I've seen that. Cologne Cathedral is a great example of the Gothic architecture, and it is the most visited site in all of Germany. There are, they tell me, 20,000 visitors to Cologne Cathedral a day. Now, I've been one of those, and it's a very busy site to be. It is so, so beautiful and so majestic that all over Germany, people are flocking to see this amazing cathedral, this house of worship. It was so fantastic that during World War II, the Allies didn't bomb this building. All around Cologne was completely flattened. But this building, this is taken after World War II. It's still oh, just before World War II, but it was still looking just like that. At the end, nothing had changed from the beginning of the war to the end, even though all the buildings that you see around it had gone. It was that impressive. But it didn't always look like that. This building, this landmark, this majestic cathedral was built in stages. It was begun in 1248. Now, I'm not good with numbers, but 1248, right? Like, 12, just remember 12 at the beginning of it, 1248. And they built this first half over there and you can see on the far right they've got another little bit of the building starting to build up with a crane on the top. Then they ran out of money. Sounds familiar to lots of church buildings. We start something and then we run out of money but we're going to keep going eventually when we get more money. A, hun a couple of Years later, they added a bit more and a bit more and a bit more. This is from the other angle. You can still see the crane up on top. It's taken hundreds of years and that wooden crane is still there. They still haven't finished the two spires that you saw. It was so, took them so long that the wooden crane on top of the tower rotted and they had to replace it with another wooden crane. It took them so long that it became the mark of their town was a tower with a wooden crane on the top. And as they went into battle, they had on their um, regalia, I don't know what you call it, their shields and things, they had on a picture of a tower with a crane on the top. It was what they were known for, was this unfinished cathedral. But then something happened. So there's the crane. Then something happened. They discovered the original plans. Many, many years later, 
The original plans were rediscovered and they put some effort in and finished the cathedral. They finished it to look like the original design, what it was meant to look like. This is now 1880. Okay, bad with numbers. We started with a 12. We're now at 18. That's 600-something years. 600 and something years it took them to build this cathedral. It was then 157 metres tall and it made it the tallest building in the world for four years. Can you imagine how many years it would have been the tallest building for if they'd finished it originally? It would have been 600 and something four years. It was a fantastic building and still is today. But the point is they went back to the original how many things would change in 600 years? How much of life has changed in 600 years up to today? Life looks very differently, yet they stuck to the original plan. And today I'm going to talk to you about church and the original plan. What is the original plan for church? Because the original plan that God intended is what church should look like today. And we've read the scriptures in the kids' time. The spirit-filled church was designed to be, the planned to be, it was planned to be learning, it was planned to be a loving church, a worshipping church and a serving church. We've read in Acts chapter 2, the, they devoted themselves, the early church, those who were filled with the spirit, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now, if there was ever a time that I can think of where people could just rely on the Holy Spirit to give them guidance and instruction, it's probably the Acts 2 church, right? The Holy Spirit has come in a real dramatic way and everyone has seen his presence and the Holy Spirit is really speaking really clearly to these people right now. If ever there was a time where you could go, I don't need to listen to any other teaching, I'm just going to listen to the Holy Spirit, that would have been it. But they didn't. They didn't just rely on the Holy Spirit to give them their teaching. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. While they were spirit-filled and they had a direct line almost to God, they simply could not just rely on what the Spirit said to them. They made sure they sat under the leadership of the apostles. They took lessons. Perhaps that was the first classroom, classrooms that filled up from the Acts 2 church. They asked their questions, they listened, they took notes, they studied. The original plan that God had for the church was that they would be a learning people. They would be a per people that came together to learn the scriptures, to listen to the words of the apostles. Now, we don't have those 12 apostles or 11 apostles here with us right now, but we do have their words we have their records. Even more than that, we have the learnings of the early church and the instructions that they were given. We have the very words of God written for us in our scriptures. If we're going to be a church, we need to be a people of the scriptures. We need to be a learning people. Now, reading the scriptures is wonderful, and I take great encouragement from reading the scriptures, particularly in the Psalms, but if I just read it, it doesn't impact my life. It needs to be more than just reading it. They didn't just read the scriptures or listen once to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. We are encouraged to do the same. Ask questions, digest the passage, learn about them. And we can learn about them in three different ways. There's maybe more, but three that I'm going to talk about today. The scriptures can be explained to you in person through the gift of the Holy Spirit. Perhaps when we were reading this morning, the Lord came with a word to you directly to your spirit and whispered in your ear what he wanted you to hear. The Holy Spirit can speak directly to us and teach us. But it also can be explained to us by the apostles, those who have teaching and instruction. We can listen to uh, those who have studied we can read the right books. We can listen to the right podcasts. We can listen to Pastor David, provided he's got the right message. I mean, he always does, but maybe not his wife. Maybe, I don't know. Whew, we'll see how we go. In case you didn't know, that's me. 
explained by the others. You can have the scriptures explained to you by the others. If the Holy Spirit tells me something and I've read it in the words and I go, yep, this is what the Holy Spirit's saying to me. And then I come to church and I listen and I go, uh, Pastor David said something different and I didn't quite, that didn't quite gel with what the Holy Spirit was telling to me. What do I do? I take it to someone that knows me. I take it to someone that knows the scriptures. I take it to someone that is part of our church and I say, help me understand this. Pastor David said this, or I've heard this, or the Spirit's telling me this. Is this true? We can have the scriptures explained to us by others who know and love us. We can explore it together. We are luckily enough in a denomination that values small group teaching, that values getting together for Bible study, for instruction, for shared prayers. Just as the new converts joined little schools that learnt the apostles' teaching, we too are encouraged to form our own schools our own classrooms, and learn the scriptures together. The Spirit-led church, the New Testament church, had a relationship with the apostles' teaching. They valued biblical teaching. We must have a similar relationship with the word. We must value biblical teaching. The next part of the verse goes on. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. I like this one. I love fellowship. The church was made to be loving. Now, that word fellowship comes from the Greek word koinonia. That means fellowship. That's the direct translation. But it comes from the word koinos. And koinos means common. Now, I was lucky enough this week to go to the pastors and leaders retreat of the the South Queensland Wesleyan leaders and pastors. And it was such a blessing to be there. But as I sat over morning tea, now I'm new, so lots of people knew each other, and I was just kind of sitting on the side trying to build some friendships and relationships. And I was looking around at the, I'm going to use the word riffraff, but you know what I mean. They're not riffraff. But I was looking around at the the Mod Podge group of people going, we've got people from this country and that country. We've got that person over there that's quite old, and we've got that person there that's a whole lot younger than me. We've got people that have come from wealthy backgrounds and have owned their own businesses and been very successful to people who are just learning and have trouble with reading. We've got a really eclectic group of people here. Now, where we were meeting was right next door to the public school. And they could see out their windows and out of their playground this group of weird-looking people all gathered together. And I thought, if I was a teacher in that school, I would be going... Who are these people and what on earth could they possibly be gathering for that would bring that diverse people together? What do they have in common? What do we have in common? The fact that we love Jesus and we want to serve him. That's the same for all of us. What do we, as a fellowship, what do we have in common? What unites us? What makes us brothers and sisters is Jesus Christ. We have something in common. So maybe you come to church and and you sit aside like I was and you look around and you go, this is kind of a weird group of people. But know that you are part of that weird group of people. You are one of us. You are part of the family of God. The loving church, fellowship, when we gather together, we embrace the love of God. The scriptures tell us where two or three are gathered, there I will be with them. When I get together with you guys, God is with us. Even if I don't bother to pay attention, he's here, he's with us. If we open our ears to that, just by gathering in fellowship, be it at youth group, be it at mainly music, Cafe Connect, be it at the women's gathering, at a Bible study, here on church on Sunday, whenever God's people gather together, they have an opportunity to embrace the love of God because we are united in his love. Not only do we get to embrace the love of God, but we get to embrace each other. And sometimes I really need encouragement. I come across like, I'm okay, I'm good, it's all fine, my family's good, we're all here. But sometimes it can be jolly lonely in the church. Anyone else go, it's a little bit lonely here sometimes? What happens when people don't turn up? 
When you've come to something and you're like, I just need people and people aren't here, it's demoralising, isn't it? Because fellowship is what God designed the church to have. We are designed to have relationships and meetings and gatherings together. It's what the early church was told to do and it's what we are told to do. So perhaps if you get up on a Sunday morning, maybe just for my sake, and you go, oh, just I could watch church at home. I could just sit in my lounge room and I could put it on and I could still get the worship songs and I can sing loudly and it doesn't matter if I'm out of tune because no one can hear me. I can open my own Bible at home. No, no, no. Come because you might be the grace that I need. You might be the grace that the person beside you needs because when we fellowship like the original church was intended to do, when we fellowship, we get to embrace each other and encourage each other. Now, sometimes when we gather together, we can rub each other up the wrong way, and that happens. I do that to people. I'm well aware of that. Apologies if I've rubbed you up the wrong way, even this morning. We're all people. But when we rub each other up the wrong way, we actually get a chance to learn something about ourselves. By being in fellowship, you become a better version of yourself. If I stayed at home on my own, I would not be aware of half the faults that I have. I would still be very aware that I'm impatient because my children are so slow. But I wouldn't be aware of some of my other weaknesses that the Holy Spirit is trying to tell me about because I learn those Holy Spirit interactions by being with people and going, oh, that really annoyed me when so-and-so did this. And I go, hang on a minute, what is that saying about that person? Or hang on, no, what's he saying about me? Why did that make me uncomfortable? Why did that make me angry? Why did that make me so, oh, that I felt like I couldn't say anything more? When we gather together for fellowship, we embrace ourselves. We see ourselves in a different way. A loving church is what God designed, a church for fellowship. We were to meet together. They have devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold their property and possessions to give to anyone in need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all people. They broke bread together. They prayed together. They worshipped together. Now, when it says break bread together, I automatically think of communion. Did your mind go there? When you read those words, they broke bread together. Lots of us think of the communion table here and how we fellowship together in the taking of communion. But in the early church, it didn't look like that. They didn't have those special words that we say and the moment to sit quietly in church. It didn't look like that. For them, the breaking of bread took part as part of a gathering in their house. When they were having a meal together, they would say, let's just stop and let's remember the words that Jesus has taught us. It took place in a more informal setting because for them worship was both informal and formal. They met in the church and they met in their homes. They met in different places. So for us, the example is there. We need to meet informally and formally. We should meet here on a Sunday, as I've already said, but we should also be sure to meet in informal ways. Now, with COVID, we have become really bad at meeting with one another. We got out of the habit of putting ourselves in people's lives and encountering them. It used to be that you'd go to the shops. Right? It was more so in Orange being a smaller town, but I would go to the shops and I couldn't go in my pyjamas and slippers because I never knew who I was going to meet and they would stop me for a talk and I'd be at the shops for an hour there in my pyjamas being embarrassed. These days, you go to the shops, you see someone, you go, yep, hello, and you keep going just in case they've got COVID, 
just in case they share their cooties with you. We tend not to even stop for those conversations when we've got the chance. We don't have people round for a meal. It's got out of habit. But we still have other things that we can do, even if you are afraid of what's out there, even if you are concerned, look, my health isn't great, I don't want to put myself at risk. We have wonderful devices. Most of them have them in our pocket. Young people, you probably can use it with your finger and not even have to put it to your ear. But part of worship is checking on each other, finding what you can pray for for that person. They met together for prayer. Now, I find that I don't have a lot of time for meeting together with prayer. My life is crazy busy, but I do have a phone. There's a little lady who has been my prayer partner since I was 11, and she continues to pray for me and for my family. And she lives on the Central Coast, and I don't get to see her, but she is my church family. And I want to worship with her. So every so often when I'm driving up the highway to pick up the kids, I dial her number and I just say, hey, how are you going? She's always had a sore back and a bad knee. And I say, well, let's just pray about that. Let's pray about it. And I pray as I drive up the highway. How could you be fellowshipping and worshipping and praying for your friends using your device, using the telephone if you're a little bit older than me? Maybe you've still got one that plugs into the wall. Grab that one. Dial the number. If you don't have a church directory, you should. Check up on each other. Now, David and I have been pastors for a little while and it would be hilarious to us when we would come to church and they would say, where's so-and-so? I haven't seen them in three weeks. And we would say, oh, well, have you followed them up? Oh, no, 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 no. That's, that's your job. You're the pastor. It's our job to pray for one another. It was the job of the early church. It's our job as the church today. We are to meet and pray for each other. If we do that via technology, that's great. Share each other's burdens. Pray for each other. That is what worship is about. It needs to be individual and communal. You can do worship at home, like we've said. You can sit on your couch and do it. And I encourage you to do that whenever you can't make it. But it's communal too. And it's to be, the scriptures tell us, glad. They join together with glad and sincere hearts. Sometimes when we come to worship, we can put on our best clothes. We can put on our lovely plastered on smile. And we can walk into church and we can say, okay, I'm here to worship God. (laughs) Yep, it's going to be joyful. Praise the Lord. (laughs) We're inside. We're going, oh, my goodness, it's the worst week of my life. They met together in sincere worship. If you enter this building and your heart is breaking, you are in pain. We want to know that because we want you to be sincere. The early church, the spirit-filled church, the New Testament church were sincere worshippers. Now, we don't want the worship to end with everybody with a sad face. And as I look around, I can see some people still frowning. Okay, I've cracked a few jokes this morning. Come on. Our God has given us love and joy and Peace, it is well with my soul. If today you've come in with a sincere heart, thank you. If you've come in broken, thank you. But please don't leave without an extra measure of love, an extra measure of peace and an extra measure of joy knowing that we have worshipped together and we've got you back. He's got your back. Worship should be sincere and joyful. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. What do we do with those verses? Do all of us now need to go and Sell everything we have, put it in the big kitty and hope that we're provided for? 
Well, there were a few religious sects around the early church that were doing just that. They were selling everything and they put all of that into one pot and they all shared together communally. Is this what the New Testament church looked like? Is that what we're supposed to do? Well, yes and no. Now, how many of you went, whew, when I said no? Yeah, it's yes and no. Some people, even today, are still called to the gift of poverty. I can think of someone she's not alive now, but Mother Teresa would have been one of those people. She had the spiritual gift of poverty. Jesus called out the rich young ruler in the scriptures and he said, you need to give away all you've got. But he didn't make that the mandate for everybody. And it's not for all the time. The church was told to do this for a specific need. If God is calling you for a specific need right now to sell everything and donate it, I know of a family who needs a house. So you can do that. If God is calling you to do that this morning, God bless you, please do that. But we're not all called to do that with all of our things all of the time. It was for a specific for specific people and specific situations. We are, however, as the early church was, called to be generous. The Old Testament had the standards for their people. The Old Testament, they were told to give a tenth of what they have. They were told to give to the, war, the widow and the poor. How is it then that the spirit-filled Christian should do just the same? No, the spirit-filled Christian has added blessings, so we should be able to give even more. We should be more generous than those. These verses from Acts tell us that the church had to go above and beyond. They had to meet the needs. And that's a challenge for us today. It's the responsibility of a church family to take care of each other. But not just with our finances, but with our time and our talents and with our treasures. We need to serve in our time. Perhaps you go, I don't have a lot of time, but I do have half an hour on a Saturday afternoon and I really care about people. How about you dedicate that half an hour of time to ringing people in the church that are doing it tough, who are sick, who can't get out? Maybe you've got the talent of being able to sing. Join our choir. Maybe you're really good at just getting in there and vacuuming. Join the church roster. Come and clean the hall. Maybe you've got the gift of hospitality and you love serving people tea and coffee. Join the morning tea team. Maybe you're a great prayer. Intercede. Be generous with your time and your talents. Intercede. Maybe you're really good at studying. You're really good at knowing the word. Maybe you've got a spirit of discernment to speak over someone. Speak out, use your gifts that God has given you. The New Testament church served those in need. We should serve those in need too. The passage says, And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. We don't do all of these church things because we want to have a fantastic mega church. Maybe you do. I don't. We don't do it so that we are so attractive to the world that everyone comes in because this is the happening place to be. This is where all the fun happens. We've got the best coffee. We've got the best people. We've got the best music. It's like a rock concert walking in. We don't do that because that's not what we are about. We don't want people to come to church because we are the place to be. What does it say? The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. We do it because we want people to meet Jesus by fellowshipping, by being people of the word, by being people that worship, by being people that serve. We see people saved. And it wasn't just stopping at the number, the word number, and the Lord added to their number. He added to their number daily. It's an ongoing thing. We can't just go, cool, that's fantastic. Five people have come to church and they've encountered the Holy Spirit and God has spoken to them. They've given their hearts over to Jesus. Yes, we did it. It's ongoing. It's never ending. 
We need people to meet Jesus. It's an ongoing, it's an outgoing work of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit-led church built relationships with the world. We too need to do the same. I'm going to invite the worship group to come up just as I finish off this morning. Recently, you were given a survey as you walked out the door. Some of you, if you were here that week, or you might have done your survey online. In those surveys, we were asked about these four areas, about the teaching at our church, about the fellowship, the worship, about how we serve. I wondered how you answered those questions. What is it that we do well here? Do we have great Bible teaching and that's what you really like? Do we read and study the scriptures ourselves in our church and in our small groups? Do we have really great loving fellowship? Fellowship that draws us close to God, to each other and teaches us about ourselves. Do we have great worship? I mean worship here but also worship on the phone where we pray for each other. Is it both sincere and joyful? Is it individual and in community? How are we going with evangelism? Is it ongoing? Is it outgoing? Do we love each other in our community? Do we share the truths of the gospel in our community? Do we? Do we do these things? Do we do them well? What can we change today? That's the model for the early church. That's the model for us. It's what God designed church to be. What can you change today? We want our church to be the best church it can be for God. There is one verse I skipped over. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. This tells me one more thing about the early church was that it was an amazing place to be. People were filled with awe, but not because the apostles were magicians, not because they had secret powers that only they had, but because they were spirit-filled. Even if we try and have all those other things, unless we have the Spirit of God dwelling within our church, within our church, within our church, all these things won't come to anything. So if we can say, yes, we have all of those wonderful things and we do them very well, Talia, perhaps we just need another dose of the Holy Spirit. If nothing else, our church needs more of his presence. The plan for the church is to be learning, to be loving, worshipping, serving, and to be filled with his spirit. Father God, we pray for a dose of your spirit just now. We pray that we can be your church here in Logan. We want to be church to each other, Lord, so we can encounter you, so we can support each other. We want to be church to our community so that they may see your light shining, so that they may come to meet you. And Father God, we want to be church because we want to draw close to you, because we want you to speak to us. Father God, fill us with your spirit this morning and help us be the best church we can be. Amen.